well, I guess I will turn off the blues. That kind of music always reminds me of my grandfather, Papa Carvey Irwin Sr. We called him Tater Rooter, the farmer. You guys know I talk about Tater Rooter a lot, but Tater Rooter loved the blues. So every now and then I turn on a little bit of the blues, but my music of choice is gospel music. That is the music that I feel. That is the music that I sing as well as opera and various African folk songs. So today I wanted to come outside. I have the air condition on. It's been a little cool in Philadelphia for the past six weeks. It's been rainy and we finally got some 80 degree weather yesterday and today. So I wanted to come out in the neighborhood, my old stomping grounds. This is the neighborhood where we've owned many properties over the years. We were instrumental and on the forefront of changing this neighborhood in the late 80s and early 90s when it was still a bit war-torn from the riots of the 1960s. So I came out to be in the beautiful surroundings. There's a park just right near where I'm parked and before I go out into the park, I just wanted to get my scripture studies in for the afternoon. I've already done my morning devotion. If you've been following me, you know that I am doing a review of Dr. Howard John Wesley's sermon series entitled, Don't Miss the Signs. Out there on YouTube, Dr. Wesley is studying in the sixth chapter of the gospel according to John and we'll read a little bit of that it's a pretty lengthy chapter and he urges us to study this and read this in our private worship time and this is the story that we've heard many times about Jesus feeding the multitude but I've never quite heard it spoken the way Dr. Wesley speaks of it Chapter 6 and verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? So we know the story. I'm going to skip on down to verse 12. Actually, I'll go to verse 11. And Jesus took the loaves, and he, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down and likewise of the fishes as much as they would when they were filled he said unto his disciples gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Now, in part four of this sermon series, Dr. Wesley talks about how it is dangerous for us to compare our lives to other people. And let me bring my camera in closer. I totally agree with Dr. Wesley that it is extremely dangerous for us to look at the way our life is the way our life has been constructed to look at the gifts that we have been given and say to our God that we are not satisfied with what he has done for us to say to our God that there's something different that could have been done that is shameful now if you study the history of television, you know back in the 1950s when advertisement became really popular, the people began to have a bird's eye view into the lives of other people. Because of advertising, 
we began to be able to see, I wasn't around in the 50s, but we began, as a people, we began to be able to see, well, hey, they have a black and white television over there, or they have a big hot pink toaster, if you study the items that they had in the 50s. When we think about June Cleaver and Ward Cleaver, you might think about June getting a new dress that Ward was able to afford to buy because he had just gotten a raise. And you look and you think, well, I don't have that. In my own mind, I need to check these statistics, but I would also be willing to say that theft began to increase when advertising and television shows began to broadcast what people had in their homes. Because if you don't know, then you don't know. But that's something that I'll have to delve into. And perhaps I read a study like that at one point, and it leads me to think that theft began to increase when people were able to see what others had. But if we bring it forward to today in Dr. Wesley's sermon series, he talks about the edited versions of people's lives that we see on Snapchat, that we see on Twitter, that we see on Facebook. People always put their best foot forward, but how often do we come out and say, hey, I made a huge mistake and I'm going to post and broadcast this huge mistake that I made. Every now and then, you'll find people who are unashamed to have a transparent testimony. And I always stop by people's Facebook pages as I'm scrolling when I get a few minutes break or I've been working really hard and I need to just breathe and decompress. We go to see what our friends and family members are doing on Facebook and Instagram. And while Instagram has turned into this virtual business card for entrepreneurs looking at people living their quote unquote best lives can sometimes make us look at what we have and it can make us say well god i don't have those things and for the, for the people who suffer with that kind of comparison and that kind of jealousy to me, I think that's just a travesty. And I would encourage each of us to look at what the Lord has done for us. And whenever we feel like the Lord hasn't done enough, think about a time that you thought was just horrible, that you wouldn't make it through. And look at yourself now and say, well, you know, I did make it through that. God is good. God is good now. God was good then. And God will be good to me in the future. And that's whether or not we stay the course and that's whether or not we always do what's right. In part four, Dr. Wesley talks about this misnomer that we have, that if we do the things that we are supposed to do, that God will answer our prayers the way that we expect them to be answered. The Bible teaches us that man that is born of a woman is of a few days. Our life is short. It's like a vapor man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. But I will tell you that you can take trouble and you can look at it with a different set of glasses. Or sometimes you can take your glasses off and you can get a full scale view of your life. I don't know if you wear your glasses for reading like I do because I can see a hawk on a mountain those tiny little words I better get those uh, bifocals on so that I can see but we have to sometimes just rearrange our vision to just bring things into focus don't miss the signs this is the first sermon series that we're doing I jokingly say that nobody wants to hear me talk about CRISPR Cas9 and what I see under my microscope a select group of people find those things to be interesting. But in this time that we are in, I have searched and I have asked God, God, how can I use the gifts that I have? How can I take the Venn diagram that is my life, the intersection of science and religion and family life and entrepreneurship and the study of womanhood? How can I take those gifts that you have given me and help your people. And this is what the Lord gave to me. And I hope 
first of all, before I hope that more people will buy my book, let me thank the people who have purchased the book. How did I make it over? It talks about the trials, the tribulations, the triumphs, and the treasures that I have experienced on my life's journey. You don't have to get the story from anybody else. You can get the story from me raw. When I didn't even know that it was going to be a book, when it was just a journal that was soaked with tears, where I had touched my face and then touched my pencil or my pen and then touched the paper, smudged with lipstick, smudged with tears, you can get the story just the way the Lord gave it to me when I was looking for Toivo, when my family was looking for Toivo. And we were blessed to get Toivo back for 18 months. We were blessed to see him flourish as an entrepreneur, as a 21 year old with his first property. We were blessed to see him majoring in business. That's what a lot of the disagreement was about, that the leadership in our household felt that Toivo was not using his full potential. We all make mistakes. Sometimes we want to guide and direct our children's lives and we want to tell them what to major in because our money, our paychecks, our investment accounts are attached to those tuition dollars. But when I'm speaking to mothers and when I'm speaking to grieving people and to parents, I say, sometimes we have to not take such a hardcore position with our parenting, especially with the parenting of young adult children who are fledgling. They're not, they don't have a credit score just yet because we're still putting them on our credit cards so that they can get a credit score. We're still teaching them how to take their monies that they earn from their summer jobs and not spend it all in one place and how to invest and how to set up a budget. We can be oppressive as parents. I'll be the first person to say that. That's my form of transparency. Sometimes we can be oppressive as parents and we need to, I know having a democratic process in the household is not popular. It's not what we've been told. We've been told, I brought you into this world and I'll take you out. But is that the rhetoric that we should be saying in 2022? Maybe that was okay to say in 1865 when we had to beat our children and keep them in line so that they would not be killed by the patrollers who became police officers. Oh, I know it seems like I'm going way off the topic, but this is really not me talking. This is just what the Holy Spirit is giving me to give to the people today. Don't miss the signs, they are all around us. I am so amazed when I hear people and see people with the wow emoji when yet another terrorist a homegrown domestic terrorist who has written a manifesto goes into a place or their mother drives them to a place and they wreak havoc on a group of people that they don't even know. You hate someone because you, as Dr. Francis Cress Welsing stated, you fear that you will be genetically annihilated. You fear that someone is taking your place. You fear, maybe not you personally, but you in general, you fear that reverse racism is going on. And I need to tell you that I learned right here in this neighborhood at Temple University under the tutelage of Dr. Maleficate Asante and his then wife, Professor Kariyama Asante, that there is no such thing as reverse racism. Because in order for racism to happen, you have to control something. What industry do we have power and control over? There's no industry that we have power and control over. Not even fried chicken dinners. Not even the fried fish that we consume on Friday nights. We don't have a black owned, nationally owned chicken franchise that we can say that we own. So this weekend was a tough weekend for people who look like me. It was a tough weekend because 
yet again we wake up to the ongoing war that has gone on against us even before we came to the American shores in slave chains and shackles. There were some of us who were here before the Mayflower, and there are scholars who have written that book you need to read uh, before, the Mayflower, before the Mayflower, pardon me. And I believe that author is uh, Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. There has been a war that's gone on against us and we're not fighting back. We're not fighting back, but we are at war. We are being attacked. And so when people who are third wave feminist want me to get on board with their branch of feminism as a Pan-Africanist, I have been uh, Pan-African even before I knew what Pan-Africanism was. I was Pan-African as a little girl. I was eight, nine, and 10 years old, and I was speaking the Pan-African tenets. But when I transferred to the university and I enrolled in the Black Studies courses and I said, oh, okay, I now know what to call how I feel. I was talking like Marcus Garvey when I was 12. And you may not agree with everything that uh, Marcus Garvey said. You know, I hear people saying, well, Marcus Garvey didn't even make it as a philosopher. He didn't even make it to Mother Africa. I believe he would have at some point, but he was here working boots on the ground in New York City. Right up the street here, there is a Universal Negro Improvement Association right up the street from that brownstone that I raised my children in before we moved out to the main line. There is a Universal Negro Improvement Association and students at Temple University would go to the meetings at the UNIA because we were hungry. We were looking in the 80s, we were looking for solutions to the same old race problem that happens over and over and over and over. And a dear friend of mine whose PhD is in sociology, Dr. Zita Seshi says all the time, 100 years from now, there will be couple of scholars sitting and contemplating the same topics that we discuss right now. Who will step up and be a spokesperson? Will you wait until all of your ducks are in a row before you step up and bring your gifts to society? Will you allow the fact that you are divorced, the fact that you have had some brushes with the law, the fact that you were a single mom, the fact that you don't have a high quality camera. Will you continue to allow those things to stop you from being a part of the solution? How many signs do we need? Now, I love to study my scripture and I study my scripture every day. I have friends who are devout Christians I have friends who are devout Jews. I have friends who are devout Islamic uh, people. I never allow the differences in our spiritual practices to stop me from having sisterly relations with those women. Because I'm sitting here at a stop, at a stop sign. I'm, I'm parked, I'm not illegally parked, but I'm, I'm parked here, parallel parked, and I can tell you, that there is a lot of stuff that happens in America at a stoplight. And when we are stopped at the stoplight because you did a rolling stop, they don't ask you, may I see your card, your religious card? They want your license, your registration, and I pray that you are keeping them current. I pray that you are opening your emails on time. I pray that you're opening your mail on time because there are cameras at these red lights they will send a ticket to your house and you can be so busy going back and forth to work, rearing your children, taking care of your wife and your children, that your license can be suspended and you might not even know it because you're out here working double shifts. Let's slow down and let's get organized and bring our gifts to the table. Talk to me in the comments. Let me know if there's a topic that you want me to discuss. People have sent emails, they've called me, they've sent text messages to my cell phone letting me know exactly 
which ministers they want me to discuss. We're going to talk about Pastor Gino Jennings. Lord have mercy, I have been following Pastor Jennings when he probably had less than 50 people in his fellowship, when he was just a small church in Philadelphia. And now he has a huge church. He has a huge church in Delaware. He's nationally known. He's internationally known. My husband and I used to watch uh, Pastor Jennings on Sunday nights, and that was our entertainment because Pastor Jennings is rough. He hits you over the head with the Bible. We're going to talk about Minister Louis Farrakhan and his doctrine. We're going to talk about his track record and what he and the Nation of Islam have done in war-torn communities. We're going to talk about the fact that they have used their platform to get women out of prostitution. They have a strong prison ministry. I have a dear friend that I haven't talked to in years out of uh, Miami Gardens and her name is Shireen. Hampton and Shireen has a strong belief that if your church is not doing prison ministry, local jail ministry, that you are not following New Testament scripture. I learned how to do uh, local county jail ministry right here in Philadelphia at the 63rd and Vine Street Church of Christ with Brother um, Jackson, Brother Henry Jackson, and Sister Anita Jackson. Uh, great leadership family there at Vine Street, which is now Overbrook Park Church of Christ. Brother Washley Grant was very instrumental in that ministry. We did door knocking in West Philadelphia, in North Philadelphia. I took for many years my gospel group and we did ministry at Montgomery County Community College. And I was able to be a blessing for many years to Montgomery County, um, not the community college, but the correctional facility. And years later, the work that I have done there, it has even helped me personally in my times of need. So I, I just want to urge us to continue to search ourselves. We are still in this global pandemic and I have done web logging, video logging, even before we hit the pandemic, I've had a YouTube channel for years, but I did not become faithful to the YouTube channel until I published my book, How Did I Make It Over? And that was back in 2018 and 2019, that we set some of these platforms, these this infrastructure, we set it in place and we intend to do the work, but we don't do the work until something traumatic happens in our lives and we are catapulted forward where we don't even have a choice. I didn't have a choice but to become vocal on YouTube with some of the fights and some of the uh, demonic forces that I was facing dealing with the death of a child. Job had a testimony. Sarah and Abram had a testimony. What is your testimony? And when will you step out and use the gifts that God gave you to become a leader? There is a leader in everyone, whether you need to take a leadership course, whether you need to sit at the feet of your local leadership and find your gifts. You don't have time to be jealous of someone else's gift. If you are struggling with jealousy and comparing yourself to someone else, you don't have that time. Take that time and take that energy and find your own gifts. Now you know that I love books and today I wanted to bring a book with me. This book is called Lift Every Voice, Sing Two. It is an African American hymnal. Now I didn't get this book at my church, at the Church of Christ, because I visit other places and I go and sing opera and gospel and I go to workshops and I lead workshops at other houses of worship. I get a chance to see how other people worship. And a minister gave me this book. It has all of the old Negro spirituals in it. And you won't believe that this African American hymnal was given to me by a white priest in the Catholic Church. I never knew that this book existed until about 20 years ago when I stumbled upon it. And it has the red and green and black on it like the African flag that's really impressive for me so I also urge you 
to get out of your comfort zone a little tiny bit. Get out of your comfort zone and just meet other people. Find out how they are similar to you. Find out how they are different than you are. Meet me back here again. I don't have a certain time that I post. I post when I can. My work schedule is hectic. My family life is hectic and I post when I can, but I don't allow my schedule to stop me from posting. Thank you to the people who have followed me on Facebook and who gave me the feedback about the audio quality as we were listening to Dr. Wesley. So right now, my team of graphic design folks, we are looking at some various software packages. The two that we ordered are not quite what we need, so we are still looking for a platform that can help me split the screen on YouTube and be able to analyze the various sermons. If you know of a software, I've been told that iMovie can do that, and that is out of my realm of expertise, so I have to call on Greg and Ariel and May to do those things for me and Hadida, but we have a strong network here at the Campus of Care and we work to get our message out and there is a, a difference between the medical research work that I do in my company and my side projects, my literary work, my memoirs that I write, uh, the speaking engagements. We kind of collaborate where I go out with the grief team, our mental health team, and I give my personal testimony and set up tables and share my personal books. Get out there and get your work done. And I thank you so much for supporting the work that I do. Bye-bye now.